So now we're moving on in here to a special session hosted by Microsoft. And Microsoft is one of all those great forces that really want to change society, make a difference. And that is what we need. We need to do this together to make a change. Businesses and industries have historically made huge differences, and this work will continue. And of course, I think tech industries are key to success here because, as you know, we are not only here live, we are online, even on the World Anti-Bullying Forum. So how do we do this together? How do we find new solutions to fight anti-bullying and erase it completely? Uh, this is what we will talk about next. And we will have a prominent panel here on stage to discuss that. And it will all be led by the Director of Global Campaign Power of Zero, Nicholas Carlyle. Welcome on stage. Yes. Welcome, welcome, Thank you welcome. Very much. Nice to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, pleasure to have you here. Are you thrilled to have your panel on? Well, this is a really important subject we're talking about, enabling empathy. It's yeah. one of the key questions of our age. Yeah, and I know that you're really engaged in this uh, question. I, I have spoke to Microsoft so many times about yes. this, and I love your energy and passion for this question. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will leave this stage to you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'll see you <laughs> later. So. Welcome, everybody. This session is made possible by the generosity of Microsoft. Thank you for that. And we have a, a full room of people here. If you're joining online, welcome online. There's a chance to ask questions. We want this to be a very much an interactive panel. And I believe at some point, they'll be putting the QR code up on there so you can start to think about your questions. And probably we'll have to put that through the um, session quite frequently. Today's session addresses one of the most challenging effects of the information age in which we live. It seems that when we go online, our capacity for empathy starts to fade away. If I can't see the whites of your eyes, if I can't read your body language, if I can't see how you are, I start to forget about your humanity. And it seems that empathy and the failure of empathy is part of the reason why we see increasing levels of online divisiveness and cyberbullying. And the numbers around that are quite staggering, and they got worse in the course of the pandemic. So last year in the United States, the Pew Internet study, which is a wonderful source of information, did a study of adults in the United States, and they found that 25% of adults we're reporting severe online harassment. If you add in more general harassment, the percentage of adults in the United States being harassed is 40% online. Quite shocking. And this is a worldwide phenomenon. And a big thanks and a big shout out to Microsoft and Jacqueline Beaucher for her Digital Civility Index. I don't know how many of you have, have been tracking that. But it's a very important metric that Microsoft created six years ago and it tracks online behavior for adults and teenagers across four different dimensions of behavior. And it's useful because it's expanding globally. So they're now tracking 22 countries across the world. And what the most recent findings will show, and they did the survey just a few months ago, it was a survey of 11,000 students across 22 countries. And what they found was that 82% of participants said that online civility had decreased during the pandemic, 82%. So there's a very generalized sense that things have got worse online. So this question, this question of empathy is something that's very close to my heart. I, I started a organization called Power of Zero. And what we are focused on is teaching young children the life skills that they need for this online, offline world that they're, they're in. And we'll talk later about the, the world that teenagers and, and children find themselves in right now. But increasingly, they are online. So how do we teach them these essential skills? And how do we teach them empathy, which is often considered the core of social intelligence, the core of how we relate with social and emotional intelligence to another, another human? So that's what we're going to be covering today. And to help us do this, we have 
some panelists here today with us in Stockholm, and we have three panelists joining us online. And I'm going to introduce them one by one so you can, you can see who they really are. And we're going to start off with Nina varanen volkanen Can you come and join us, please, on the stage? <laughs> so Nina is the executive director of Soyolan Lapsia, which in, in English is Protect Children, based in Finland. She is an expert in child protection and combating transnational sexual crimes against children, especially online sexual abuse. She's also a psychotherapist. She's been working in this field of health for over 28 years and in the field of protecting children for over 15 years. So let's give her a big round of applause. We also have in, in, in the room Janina Buckland, and, and Janina is the CMO for Microsoft Finland. Come and join us. So, Nina describes herself as a people-centric and customer-oriented marketer, passionate about bridging technology and empathy. Janina has broad experience in different marketing positions, from small startups to large international companies. She is also a former victim of bullying. Sorry, uh, so many of us have had that awful experience. And it feels strong empathy for children today, who, unlike her, are unable to escape bullying in the safety of their homes. And then we have some panelists who are joining us online. So, Elizabeth, I don't know if you are uh, able to join us online on the screen. Oh, there you are. Oh, there you yes, are. Good. I'm here, Nicholas. Good morning. Good morning. So, Elizabeth, um, is, it brings uh, the gift of having done some really important research, which we'll be hearing about later, with, with Enable in, in Europe. She's an online safety consultant in Europe and an independent expert for the Council of Europe. And she supported European Schoolnet on the Enable program, as well as supporting e-enfance, the French helpline. And I'm also very happy to bring on two of the teen ambassadors from the Microsoft Council for Digital Good. So first up, we're going to have Theo Todoran. Are you there, Theo? Yes. Oh, that's good. We've got Theo there, and we've also got Anna Lena Boten. So you're both there. So a warm welcome to you. It's, uh, I'm so happy to have you in this room because you can help us adults make sure we're talking sense <laughs> and truth and uh, saying things that are actually true about your generation, which is really what we're here today to, to, uh, to help. So Theo, um, you join us fr from Romania, and I believe you're, you're in the first year of, of high school. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, um, well, in Romania, we have like high school profiles and I picked a profile that is very heavy in mathematics and computer programming. And one of the reasons why I decided to study a lot of programming and um, basically cybersecurity at school was getting accepted into this council. And I'm also very passionate about combating cyber crimes and bullying of all kinds since I have also been bullied in middle school a lot, and um, yes. Thank you, well, welcome. And then let's move to Anna-Lena Boten, who I believe joins us from Germany. <laughs> tell, tell us about yourself. Um, so um, I'm in 11th grade at a grammar school in Germany, and we have like all kinds of subjects. So um, mathematics, biology, German, English, of course, and French. Um, so I'm very into languages because I just like speaking them and um, I also like traveling a lot um, because of COVID that was not possible, um, but I really love different cultures and that is also what leads like um, to bullying in a lot of cases because, for example, when you have different race, as we already heard earlier, then um, there's bullying and I hope that I can like be a contact person for my person environment that I can help people who suffered from bullying so that we're just like um, happy all together and that we're like trying to support each other. Thank you. That's, that's a, a beautiful and important vision you have. And um, I'm glad you're all here joining us today. So it's a great gift to have all of these panelists here. 
And I want to start with you, Elizabeth, because you bring the gift of, of your fresh with research on the teenage space, and I believe with Enable, the Enable project in, in Europe, you've been studying cyberbullying and tracking cyberbullying in the different countries in, in Europe. So I had a couple of questions that I'm hoping you can mm -hmm. help us with today, um, and, and they're obviously linked. The first one is help us understand what is the Enable project and the research you've done. And then secondly, I would love it if you, if you tell us what was the most surprising finding for you in that research? Okay, thank you for <laughs> great questions. Um, first of all, the Enable project is um, the uh, European Network Against uh, Bullying in Learning and Leisure Environments. And this was a project um, supported by the European Commission. It was a two-year project and we brought in lots of different uh, partners um, th that you may know, Nicholas, um, for example, the Diana Award with their anti-bullying uh, ambassadors. And basically we looked at social and emotional learning across six different European countries. And we focused on 11 and 14 year olds um, in an effort to you know, find something, find that key in cyberbullying prevention. What we found, and this might be a, a bit of the answer to your question uh, about what was the most surprising fact, is that 11 to 14 was too late. Um, 11 to 14 was too late to begin emotional and emotional learning and training because these, these teens had already um, been embedded with ideas and stereotypes and you know, seeing different role models, whether as we already heard, uh, whether they be politicians or in the classrooms. And so what we found was that um, actually in Denmark, using a younger model of teaching social and emotional learning and and not just saying being kind, but you know everything that goes with that, that builds out, um, beginning that as early as three years old would be the most effective way to uh, combat bullying in learning in leisure environments. Now, I think it's important, Nicholas, that I stress that this was just one project uh, of many. Um, earlier this year, I had the pleasure of being with Nina um, on, in a project with the Council of Europe, again, looking at cyberbullying um, and trying to, you know, train uh, police officers, law enforcement, you know, looking at this interdisciplinary approach of cyberbullying and victimization from sociological, psychological, legal and law, uh, and, um, uh, law enforcement perspectives. Because the, the fact is, is that this phenomenon is it's here, it is continuing, and it's having uh, even more effects across Europe. So unfortunately, I wish I had more positive things to say uh, about the, the, the research and, and what we're seeing. But I can say that um, the Council of Europe, European Commission, Better Internet for Kids, many of the European organizations, organizations are taking this as a first-rate challenge to, uh, to really eradicate bullying. Thank you. That's, that's a, a really important insight. Um, and I think what you're pointing to, Elizabeth, actually correlates with a lot of the, the emerging research we're seeing. The organization for the OECD has uh, recently re released a report um, and it was studying social and emotional intelligence in five, six, seven-year-olds, and it had these chilling words. Starting behind means staying behind. Starting behind means staying behind. And what they meant by that is if you fail to teach children under the age of eight the sort of social and emotional learning you're talking about, we're talking about, they may never catch up. It's that important. Exactly. So it's, it's thrilling to have with us on it today uh, Nina, because uh, Nina is, and it's a very nice uh, 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 reason for you being here, you, you recently created this empathy pack, which I believe is for five to nine-year-olds, and it's exactly the sort of demographic that Sir Elizabeth is talking about. So tell us a little bit about what this empathy pack is, and also I would love to know what motivated you to create this empathy pack. I think Janina oh, and the Microsoft, yes, okay. was the creator of the empathy okay. pack. I would take that. Okay, I'm sorry. You know. <laughs> Janina, you take that question. It's co-created, so yes. we're all in this yes. together. Yes, sorry. But it's fine. Thank you. And I think uh, I really appreciate what Elizabeth was saying about um, how early uh, yes. we need to start this yes. work with the children. Yeah. So empathy pack. Um, 
the, a, a bit of history behind that is that, as said in the introduction, when I was a kid, I was a victim of bullying, but uh, I was able to um, sort of like escape that bullying to the safety of my own home. But kids of today are not as lucky as I am. Instead, they are vulnerable 24-7. So what I like to say is that we have created the environment our kids need to live in today. So we kind of like created the problem, so we need to fix it as well. So it is our joint responsibility to really come together and do things that can support kids to su successfully live their lives in the digital environment. So the way we started the project was that we wanted to first understanding what was the, we wanted to understand what was the level of cyberbullying in Finland. So we conducted a study where we interviewed 1,000 parents uh, and 400 teachers to understand what, are, what, what do they see, what do they say, and what are the biggest pain points that they currently struggle with. Uh, with. Uh, and the results that we found were really uh, alarming and controversial. So based on the research that we conducted, over 60% of kids uh, uh, in the age of 15 to 17 had experienced online bullying or harassment. So these are kids age 15 to 17. So you need to start quite early to, to not have that problem in this age. And at the same time, parents, 64% uh, of parents were saying that their kids had not been bullied online. So they did not understand what's happening in the online environment. And almost 30% of the, of the parents had not even discussed cyberbullying with their children. So, and it's not because parents don't want to. It's often because they don't know how. Yeah. And they don't have the, the knowledge, the tools, uh, and the, and the resource, resources available to have those conversations and to really understand what their role as parents is in the whole. So, so the majority of parents and teachers that were interviewed uh, still saw that parents hold, held the main responsibility in preventing cyberbullying. But at the same time, they were telling us, as just said, that they struggle to understand the online environment and what's their role as parents in the whole. Uh, and both parents and educators uh, raised a need for better digital tools to support children in building empathy skills in the digital environment. So teachers, for example, we all know have been teaching uh, interaction skills for as long as we can remember. But those materials they've been using are not updated to meet the needs of the digital era. So, so we needed to do something about that. And after analyzing the results, we quickly saw that the best way to address the issue was not finding ways to prevent cyberbullying, but instead uh, find ways to build those empathy skills that were aligned uh, with the needs of today. Uh, so in Finland, we have a globally recognized innovation called the maternity package. Uh, I hope that quite a lot of people online are already familiar with that. Uh, and it provides the necessaries for a newborn and its parents uh, to successfully start their lives together. However, I think we lack the same support for kids and their stakeholders when they enter the next chapter in their lives and begin their digital journey. So Empathy Package was uh, built to provide the same support for all the key stakeholders involved uh, in a child's lives at this very critical point of time. It pulls together the most recent and reliable information and tools for kids, parents and teachers to build uh, empathy skills and prevent cyberbullying. It's a scalable living service uh, that can be deployed in any country, so, so we don't want to host it in Finland only. We want to see this become something that, that anybody can, can take uh, into, into deployment and, and use in their countries. And instead of putting uh, together the content to get, uh, in a sort of like small group of people behind closed doors, we've heard in many discussions already during this forum that uh, I think Jacqueline said it well yesterday, that kids are telling us that don't talk to us, talk with us, and don't innovate for us, innovate with us. So we wanted to include all the stakeholders to really tell us what a package like this should host. What do we need? What, what do the kids need? What do the parents need? What kind of, uh, what do the uh, teachers need? And what is already available? Because often the problem is that just when we were building the package together, we saw that there are so many amazing programs, pieces of content, things, uh, information, you name it, available, but it's scattered all over. So we really struggle to find the, the stuff that's kind of like the most relevant and reliable 
So we wanted Empathy Package to be the place where you can go as a parent, as a child, as a teacher, to find the most recent and relevant and trustworthy content. Yes. Yes, so that means that we needed to really collaborate and we needed to really listen and we need to make sure that it's a living service as well. So if we think about what the Empathy Package today hosts, uh, it has content for all the three key audiences we identify as the main uh, stakeholders in a child's life at this point of time. So for kids, it has tools for learning empathy skills, videos from, for example, eSports e stars saying that it's uncool to bully. So if you want to become uh, an online superstar as I am, this is the way you need to encounter uh, the other children and the other players online. So we needed to kind of like influence the way bullying and, and sort of like hate speech speech uh, is seen in the online environment. Uh, also, we needed to uh, make sure that we do have the support channels there available for those who are bullied so that they can also seek for help. And for parents, uh, it hosts information and tools for both to learn about online environment and to help parents to take an active role as a parent and also tools to start those conversations with the children if you haven't done that yet. So easy, lower the barrier for those conversations and kind of like take ownership of those conversations. And for educators, there's plenty of educational content uh, teachers can easily, uh, that teachers can easily introduce into their curriculum. It's free, um, it's mainly for for uh, primary school pupils, there's, for example, a content package for 20 hours of content to learn and teach digital empathy skills. So this is, this is something that we've done in Finland, and thanks for the opportunity to introduce that, and I'm extremely glad to be able to discuss further about the topic with you. I, 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 I love what you created, and, and uh, I love this name, Empathy Pack. And for some reason, I had this vision of a child with an empathy pack strapped <laughs> on their back, like a physical pack, and it fires them up, and they're able to fly through the skies and, and uh, really, really kind of deep within their, their souls have a sense of empathy. I like and, that. And I think many of the, of the people listening online and the audience would like to know how they can access this empathy pack, and can they use it, and can they translate it and use it in their own countries? How, how do they do that? Yes, I think it's, uh, it's, it's fully scalable. Uh, and and it's, uh, you can access it online. It's in Finnish, Swedish and English at the moment. And I think the key there is to understand the way it's built. Yeah. So, so just to sort of like in any country to understand which are the key stakeholders in that country, who are the key, key players in that country, yeah. and how do, you, how do you make sure that you involve the right people and involve the right stakeholders mm -hmm. to make sure that the content you host is relevant. And, and to go online, do they search for it, or is there a particular way they can find it online? Oh, you're going to love this. It's called empatiapakkaus.fi, so it's in Finnish. So I, I, you pointed this out earlier, yeah. so we need to make sure <laughs> that, that there's also... But I think if you go online to Google, just yeah, Google empathy, package, empathy pack, Microsoft, Microsoft can, Finland, yes, yes. you'll find it. Yeah, and I think I want to, I want to make sure that the kind of like... It's, very, I, it's really kind of like even frustrating to very often host conversations about why Microsoft is doing something like this. Is there commercial objectives behind what we're doing? No, it's fully social responsibility. As a technology company and as yeah. a technology provider, we need to make sure that we, we have responsibility and we, we take action to make sure that we do something concrete and something mm -hmm. good uh, to fix the problem as well. So. That's, that's a key. So yeah. we never included or invited anybody to provide content if we saw that it, this was for commercial interests instead yes. of really supporting and helping yes. the children. Yes, no, I, I, I get that. Um, Microsoft, you and Microsoft have been great at helping us get the Power Zero campaign off the ground. And I think, I think increasingly I see a, a real commitment, especially when it's for the sake of children, for corporate citizens and researchers to all come together for the sake of children and create these, these free resources. So, so thank you for your work there. And uh, turn it to you, Nina. Uh, so the gift that you bring is, is, is that you've worked in this space for so long and you're also a psychotherapist. So you, you understand a lot of the psychological dimensions to this. And, and as I was pondering this question of online empathy and cyberbullying and recognizing that so often we, we pair them together so I think we, and I have this belief too, we, we share this belief that cyberbullying to some extent is a failure in empathy. And therefore, if we can 
teach empathy, if we can increase the levels of empathy, we can thereby reduce the tendency of children to bully both online and, and, and face to face. Um, so my first question to you, which is very much a psychological question, is, is this assumption right? And if so, how does this work? How, help us with that. Yeah, your assumption is right. And thank you for the experts, because I think the very important uh, point was that we need to start early. Uh, we know that we humans, we are born social. We are like fully social. And if we don't have interaction and love and care, we just don't become humans. Yeah. So I think that we need to start early. And this is why uh, we, Protect Children, created the material uh, for digital safety skills and, and, and guidelines for parents really early on. Yes. Yeah. Because we quite often have materials for teenagers like 11 to, uh, and, and over, but uh, the digital devices are here yeah. right now and they can be used for good. Uh, we have really good things that we can enhance the empathy with the digital devices, but at the same time, there are risks. As you said in, in the beginning of your speech, you said that we don't have eye contact, we don't see the, the when we interact, we sometimes don't see the person. I think this is the same risk with these devices. We have research, new research, that also the parents are not interacting with their babies so much because they have these devices. Mm. And I think that's a huge risk for future. And that's why we created yeah. this uh, phone park uh, for families, not only children to reduce the screen time and, and what time, you know, the screen time's a little bit older term, but but the time that the parent is interacting with the child, so they have this parking lot for phones, yes. uh, to make that interaction more, better, because that is a huge importance to yeah. build the emotional skills and empathy. Yeah, I think, I think you're naming one of the challenges here, which is, this really comes of the fact that empathy is so central to our humanity, and we learn it growing up as a child through all these different uh, facets of our life from, from our parents, as much as from our teachers at school, um, and from feeling valued as part of the, of the community. So um, my, my next question for you is, is this, is, is an empathy pack enough? And if not, what else do we need to be doing to ensure that this, this generation growing up does have a profound sense of empathy? I think the empathy pack is a great start. I think uh, this is not to be fixed in an in a easy way. We need everyone's uh, hard work and responsibility. We need companies regulation. I think that's if we are talking about the digital uh, environments. Uh, but I think also the parents are are having a hard time right now. And the teachers, I think it's really difficult because uh, our education system wasn't really prepared of this uh, revolution of the digital uh, wor world right now, yeah. what we are having right now. And I think, yeah, there's a lot of things that needs to be done. And, and I think sometimes we learn by making mistakes. And I think that we have made yeah. quite a many. Yes, and, and before we went on, we were having a, a, a really important conversation about adult role models. And um, many of us have observed the decline in political discourse in, in many countries around the world in the last um, couple of years. Um, so really, this is actually an open question for any either of you. And then I'm going to go back to the uh, online people. Um, to what extent is, 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 do adults have a responsibility here for how they, they behave online? I think <laughs> accent speaks louder than words. And we are trying to teach children, but look how we adults behave online. I think that it's, it's terrible that the adults are behaving non-empathic way. And then we are just asking the children, 
why you behave yeah. like this. Yeah. So I think that we have a huge responsibility to first correct our behavior yeah. before we kind of ask that for from children. Yeah. yeah. So if you look at the Microsoft um, Civilis Digital Civility Index, of course that spans children and adults, and rightly so. We need to get the numbers better uh, at, at all levels. So um, I want to go go back to our panel of, of teen ambassadors and to talk to Teo and, and, and Anna. So you, you've heard this whole uh, conversation now, and my question for you is, 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 is actually a, a simple one, but an important one. Um, are we getting it right? So uh, in our conversation so far, are we describing the world as you know it in terms of the online world for teens? Um, and what else do you want us to know? So either, well, either Teo or Anna, who would like to go first? Um, I would like to go first. So go ahead. So I think that you are describing it correctly. And I do believe that both children and their parents and adults in general have a great responsibility to be empathetic online. Um, but the thing is that parents have the biggest responsibility here because parents are supposed to teach their children how to behave online. So if parents aren't being empathetic in the first place and aren't being like, models for their children, children will not behave empathetically online. So, you know, we all have to start with ourselves and our parents need to educate us how to stay on how to stay safe online and how to be more empathetic. And when they're educating us, they shouldn't, um, you know, teach us to hate other people based on certain criteria. Like they shouldn't teach us to be homophobic or racist because unfortunately a lot of parents teach their children these things. Children aren't born being homophobic and racist and hating other people. They're born being empathetic and very social and very vulnerable and parents need to teach them how to be empathetic and they need to kind of maintain their innocence, you know, until they're older and teach them how to stay safe online. And how would you like parents to be teaching you and your generation of, of, of teenagers? Because I don't imagine it goes down that well for the average teenager if their parents say, I want to, you to sit down now and I'm going to talk to you about um, your behavior online. So, so how, how should parents approach that conversation? Because I, I, I hear from many parents, they don't know how even to begin the conversation. Well, they should begin the conversation calmly, first okay. off. <laughs> Good advice. Um, well, just, you know, sit down with their children at the table, like at the dinner table, for example, and start talking, like asking them, what did you do at school today? And then if anything new has been going on in their lives, like, has anyone said anything mean to you? Have you done anything that um, you thought was okay to do? And now thinking back at it, it was a really bad thing to do, for example. You know, you just start off like with the normal conversation and you slowly move towards this conversation about digital safety and empathy. And you ask them if you, when you know they did something wrong, in your opinion, you ask them what they think of what they did. Like, do you think this is okay? And then if it isn't okay, you calmly explain to them why it isn't all right to do that thing and why they should be more empathetic and how they can actually really harm someone by behaving a certain way. Mm. And I think it's that final piece, how they can actually harm someone. That, that's the teaching of empathy right there. Thank, thank you, Teo. Let's move to Anna. So, so are we getting it right here? Or if not, what, what, what do you think we should know? Um, so first of all, I totally agree with Theo. Um, in the first place, parents have to teach their children how to be empathetic because as Theo already said, like we are not born um, to be like uh, hateful or to threaten someone online. And I also think that um, many parents maybe don't know um, what the consequences of bullying can, can be. And also maybe they're not aware of the extent 
bullying can have because um i mean when when you look for example at school bullying um uh, school bullying can uh, cause really bad problems for example so in your academic career um for example because when you're physically or emotionally harmed um by people in school or online by hate comments um or let's um, specifically talk about school bullying, then, uh, you know, um, the victims don't want to go to school anymore. And then obviously you have high absences and then, I mean, your grades are dropping. So you have really bad academic issues. And I think that many parents or people in general don't, are, aren't aware of the consequences which bullying can have. So I think that we all need to work together to be empathetic online and that we all support each other. Yeah, no, I think you, I think you make good points here. Um, Can I comment yes, on that? Yes, of course. Because I think that's a super important point when we think about how we currently are very often kind of like responding to this. So we were, while we were researching uh, the level of uh, cyberbullying in Finland, we found out that kind of like one of the big sort of like things that we do wrong is that we are very focused on fixing things when they are broken instead of looking ways to proactively prevent them from happening. And the costs we pay for that approach on an individual and on a societal level are extremely high. Yeah. So just in UK, the annual cost for cyber trolling was, I think it was $3.7 billion. And in New Zealand, the costs for cyberbullying for the society were almost $450,000. These are annual costs and these are national costs we pay. Mm -hmm. And then when we think about the cost for, uh, for an individual and how that person actually uh, lives, uh, lives their life, yeah. it's really devastating. So I, I think we really need to fix the way we address these issues. Yes. So, so the prevention side we're talking about here is important. Yes. Yeah. Um, and and, and, and uh, Theo and Anna, um, we've been talking about the empathy pack and about the importance of starting young. And we're talking about children aged five, six, seven, eight, who are often just starting their online journey. What advice do you have or would you have for a five-year-old or six-year-old as they just start out on their online journey? So um, I think that's a very interesting question because um, I think there are many points um, uh, where um, the um, where you have to be like um, very. Um, I mean, um, I want to say that um, there are many possible dangers online. I think I would like say this because I I just want I think kids are not aware of the possible dangers the internet can have. Mm. So they, they don't have uh, the, the knowledge, of course, um, of, for example, um, digital security. So um, I, I know uh, many kids, for example, from like 12 to 15 years old who don't have a private account on Instagram. So like everyone can text them through messages and um, you know, as a kid, you, you don't expect something bad from unknown people because you think, oh, they just want to talk um, to me about my content or anything else. But in real life, there are bad people out there. And I think kids are not aware of that because they always think um, the, the people uh, want uh, to have a, a good conversation with them. So I think um, that I would uh, tell them to be very... Um, yeah, just to meet um, like unknown people with caution so that they don't trust uh, unknown people and that they try um, to be uh, very, um, to keep tabs on their digital security. Thank you, that, that's good advice. And, and, and Taya, what would you say to a, a, a five-year-old? One, one, one of the questions that I struggle with at Power, at Power Zero is, I don't want to scare young children about the internet. I don't want to create these terrible monster fears where they never even want to go online. So how, what, how would you torture a five-year-old about their online journey? Well, first of all, I'd like to say, I just remembered a thing that happened when I was like eight. So when I was about eight, my parents bought me an iPad 
And while they were at work, I would play for like hours, you know, all kinds of games, watching YouTube videos and stuff. And this one day, my mother came home and um, she asked me whether I wanted to play on my iPad for one more hour or whether I wanted to go to the park for one hour and physically like play and have fun with my classmates. And that day I chose going to the park and I didn't regret it. So I think first off, we should teach young children that even though um, playing games on their phone and communicating with like strangers online can be very fun sometimes, um, most of the time, it's way better to have physical interaction with people your age and try to make friends because when you're a child, it's far easier to make friends than when you're older. So um, I would tell young children that if the possibility is being given to them, always choose physical interaction with people your age and friends and classmates over playing games alone at home on your computer or iPad or phone or whatever. Yeah. And second of, I would try to teach them, you know, appropriately, like try to talk to them so they can understand me. I would teach them that not all people online have good intentions. I would just say this to them and try to explain it as well as I could. And I would tell them to not talk to anyone that they don't actually know in real life online. That is so such clear advice, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yes, you want to talk about that? Absolutely. I just salute you. <laughs> Respect yes. so wise young people giving so good advice. And I think that uh, we protect children. We made this online road safety materials because I think that we need to say to parents that the traffic is as dangerous for the children if they don't know the rules and regulations on the online traffic but but think about who parent would give their children to walk on the traffic without not giving rules not yeah. saying what is red light what is yes. yellow or what is green so we have this material for parents to start early on teaching online road safety rules and, and using the traffic lights. And that is something that many parents have been saying that this is true. And you need to guide the children in the online traffic yeah. the same way you guide them in traffic. You keep hold their hand, you teach all the time, you are there with the children yeah. using the digital devices, not just giving the device to children. So I think that is extremely important. And what Janina said, that we always just start when something terrible happens and we are totally too late because every child needs to know what they can f see online before it happens. And this is uh, really important that they have the knowledge what what I do if I see something that is disturbing me. Mm. And yes, and, and, and exactly. And how do they get help and what do they do about it? Um, yeah, very, very important points. So we've, we've got some questions coming through um, from the audience and, and from people joining us online. And please keep sending this in. Um, we've got another 10 minutes here, which is wonderful. So we've got a chance to really uh, hear from you all. The first question that came in, is, and, and, and it's a very important question, is around identity-based bullying. Inevitably, when you talk about bullying and cyberbullying, you, you have to be understanding how we're handling differences. And so the, um, the, quest, the question uh, here is, how does the empathy pack deal with identity-based bullying? We know that especially boys learn from early on to not be uh, uh, emphasize difference because it makes them seem weak. And this is strengthened by mainstream political forces. So I guess that's a question for you, Janina. Uh, thank you for the question. I think it's a, an extremely important one. And I think we just need to understand that all up bullying is never OK. So uh, nevertheless of the reasons why and how we are brought up, that should never be an excuse for unethical uh, or harmful behavior in person or online. So the way we want to approach that is to, to make sure that the way we put the content together emphasizes uh, ethical and uh, empathic behavior that, is, that has nothing to do with your identity as an individual, but it's uh, the basics of 
uh, polite uh, conversations and polite interaction, uh, no matter who you're in interacting with. Yeah. So I think that's uh, extremely important. It should not have anything to do with that. And I think as a society, when we've been trying to kind of like approach, we want to approach the, the issue sort of like bottom up. So not instead of the way our, uh, many of the societal parties currently are built is that it's very siloed. So it actually makes it really difficult to support a child sort of like um, uh, as a whole, in a sense that we look at the child as, an, as a whole individual and we can't sort of like silo the way we support the children. Mm. So what we see is, and what we've heard even through the way we have created the content for empathy package, uh, from many of the parties, uh, if, if it's the National Agency for Education or the Ministry uh, of well Welfare and Health, they say that, oh my God, this is the first time we're actually able to collaborate and we're actually able to, to work together and to look at the child and all the stakeholders in a child's life together and create uh, solutions that support them in that way. So we think, I think we need to break down those silos mm. to, to be able to support ch children as individuals and include the stakeholders who play a role in the child's life when they grow up and, and sort of like learn about the digital environment. And we need to be able to embrace collaboration, even of, between the public and private sector, as well as the, uh, as well as the different societal and governmental parties. And I want to bring Elizabeth in, in on, on this question, because I'm, I'm guessing from your research through Enable, you were also tracking cyberbullying based on, on differences and, and identity. And, and I'm curious what you found and, and, and what insights you have for us. Yes, well, actually, Nicholas, I would even say um, we didn't do as much tracking then because the Enable project was between uh, 2014 and 2016. But I can speak with my hat on from Eon Fonts, which is one of the helplines. So in Europe, there are uh, the, the InSafe network, which has 27 helplines. And every single year, we see that cyberbullying is the number one cause of concern. And what's interesting is that the children and the parents that are calling in, they are mentioning all sorts of reasons for being bullied, including ethnic, uh, religious um, types of harassment. So we are seeing it in, in the helplines. What I think is more frightening is to think of the people who aren't calling us, who aren't reaching out and, and asking for support. So I think that um, uh, personally, as a woman of color, cyberbullying and harassment for, for differences is something that unfortunately we are seeing more and more uh, in the United States and in Europe. But I do believe that um, something like this empathy pack and having the voices of our teens uh, is one of the most vital ways to combat this, is that they don't see, uh, as, as Theo said, and Anna Lena, I, I believe as well, that children really aren't seeing these types of differences. And as, if we can keep that going, um, we might have a chance at finally eradicating uh, bullying of all types. Thank you. Thank you. The, the next question focuses, um, and importantly so, on the students who are bullying. So it's, it's, it's easy and tempting to focus on, on, the, on the children who are the targets of bullying. But the question here is, what's our advice for students who are engaged in bullying? Would you like to answer that one? Yeah, I could take uh, that question. Good question, and I think that's uh, in a way that I think that children behave uh, kind of uh, always if they have the skills quite okay. And I think that there is so much vulnerability behind the, those children who bully. They, they, there is not one reason for the bullying. Mm. Uh, there is always multiple uh, factors that make person to bully. And quite often there are vulnerabilities like adverse childhood experiences or some difficult emotions that they can't handle mm -hmm. which makes them to bully. It's a difficult question how we uh, would deal with them but, but it is saying that the most the children who uh, they need love those who are uh, behaving like totally that you just want to think that they are really, really not, uh, it's difficult to love them and give them care and support. And I think that there is much about our educational system, which was built to 
build up children uh, to become uh, workers uh, and now it's uh, it's we don't teach uh, emotional skills in in preschool so much and we need to do that yeah yeah thank you thank you with the Nicholas, may, may I add yes something? of course Elizabeth oh thank you I just wanted to say um, Nina is spot on and something that I tell parents all the time is that it's not the child it's the behavior and I think it's really critical because uh, unfortunately bullies become labeled as uh, as these bad bad people and it's the behavior that has to change um, they are just as much a victim uh, if not more so than the, than the children unfortunately that they're targeting or the bystanders who are, who are seeing this who also have emotional and psychological effects. So just wanted to make sure that parents realize it's the behavior and that they can do something. They can support the bully. Yeah, I, I often think about an incident of bullying as, as shining a spotlight on, on a group of students. And that spotlight needs to be sh shone on, on that group of students because there's suffering that's going on there. And we have students who are at risk on both sides, both the bullying students and, and the targets. And so really it's a call to us adults to step in and ask what's actually going on here. So, so thank you for that. Yes, Janina. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on that as well because it was so interesting to read the definition of school bullying that, that was sent out by UNESCO and, and the World Anti-Bullying Forum. Uh, I think it was the first day uh, that the, the forum started. I think it touches upon many of the topics related to the question. So I really encourage to read that through because there is also in physical bullying and especially bullying in school, there's also the third target group who are the ones who are seeing the bullying. Mm. And we should not neglect them as well. It's extremely harmful for children in that age to actually, if they are not bullying or being bullied, but to experience that and see that. So it, it's, it's really something that we need to pay close attention to. Thank you. And yes. if I can say that empathy works well, I mean, we have also made a study with the empathic way to kind of uh, compassion focused uh, way to ask uh, offenders uh, why they are doing, why they are offending. Yeah. So I think even those who do crimes, they really started to answer. And we have more than 12,000 answers from the uh, sexual offenders now because we we ask them with the compassion yes. way and with the empathic yes. way, help us to help you. Yes, and help us to understand what's happening for you. Yes, so that sounds like a session, another session in, in itself. So, so let's go to, uh, to uh, Teo um, and Anna for this, this final question, which is addressed uh, to you. So could you speak to how youth perceive the way that teachers handle bullying in their classrooms? Could you speak to the way which youth perceive how teachers handle bullying in their classrooms? So either of you could answer that. Teo or Anna, do you want to talk to that one? Have we lost them? No, no, they're still here. Perhaps a better question, Nicholas, is have they seen that? Because perhaps they haven't seen it in their classrooms. <laughs> so have you, have you seen any of that, um, either of you? where um, teachers have been involved, or is there a way that you would like for teachers to, to intervene? And this can also be for adults. Um, I actually have seen something like this. This is a very minor situation, but this one time I was like in the third or fourth grade, and some of my classmates were picking on me through text messages. So my mother got angry and she came to the school and started talking to my teacher. And um, after they were done, she walked into the classroom. She stood in front of us and she called out the people who were being mean to me and basically embarrassed me in the process because it would have been like embarrassing for my mother to go and talk to the teacher just because she found out that they said a few things about me. And it didn't even really bother me. It bothered me that the teacher called me and them out in front of the classroom and embarrassed all of us in the process. So I think teachers should go and talk to every single person separately without calling them out in front of other people. Like in Romania, people, adults usually, um, our families and the teachers and everyone 
thinks that a way to educate us is to embarrass us in front of other people to like teach us a lesson. Well, when actually they should just go and talk to us personally and try to understand what's going on with us and try to fix the problem with us face to face alone, not try to embarrass us in front of multiple people, you know? So that's what I think that teachers in Romania are doing wrong for once. And I don't know about Alenina, but that's my perspective on this. So Anna, do you want to come in on this? Do you have a thoughts? Um, so I have to say, I never experienced like a teacher in a situation of bullying. Um, but I also think that it is important that we're not bystanders, um, uh, that that we're upstanders so that um, I, I think when you witness bullying at school, for example, uh, you should offer your help immediately. And that is also like for teachers and like for everyone else, I think, um, because you you have to show, like, for example, the victim that um, that he or she is not alone in that so that there are always um, people um, who who can talk, who you can talk to. Yeah. Um, and I think that's also a question of responsibility because everyone has responsibility in our social network. So that is for teachers, adults, yes. and also like for our young generation. And I think everyone, so our our generation has to work um, together for a harmonious coexistence. So Thank I think- you. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful <laughs> words. Um, you're not alone is a really important concluding message here. Um, we need to bring this very important panel discussion to an end. Thank you, Teo, Anna, and Elizabeth for joining us online. Thank you, Janina and Nina for joining me on the stage here today. Um, there's lots of other great uh, sessions going on this morning, so, so keep online, but we will now say goodbye and thank you. Thank you. Thank you.